set, all set up there, yep, fine. Okay, welcome to the afternoon session and as you see on the board there, Jared Smith is from Red Hat and he'll be talking about Red Hat and Fedora. So please give a warm welcome to Jared, thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, I'm very happy to be here today, happy to, to come out to LCA. Everybody enjoying the conference? Oh, come on, it's afternoon, come on, we need a little more energy in the room, come on. Is everybody enjoying the conference? Yes. Well, you know, I'm, I'm very much enjoying the conference, I'm happy to be here. This is my first time to, to LCA, first time to Australia, and very happy to be here. Um, to kind of set the uh, agenda for what I want to talk about here today, um, first of all, um, I want to uh, I'll give a, a little bit about me and what my background is. Um, that's usually the first question people ask me is, who are you? Um, the second question is, well, how did you get to be the Fedora project leader? So I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and then I want to talk about how Fedora came to be, um, kind of the relationship between Red Hat and Fedora and how that works and, and where we want to take things in the future. Does that sound good? Any, any complaints, questions, Rotten Tomatoes before I get started? Um, I like to do very informal presentations. I'm not going to stand up here and do death by PowerPoint. Um, if you have questions, raise your hand. We'll pass a microphone around so that we can ca capture the audio on the, on the recording. But I, I do want it to be a very informal thing. I've probably got 20, 25 minutes or so worth of slides. And then I want to leave a lot of time at the end for questions and answers and that sort of thing. That sound good? All right. So to give you a little bit, bit uh, a background about me, again, my name is Jared Smith. I'm the Fedora project leader. Um, and what, do, what does that mean to be the Fedora project leader? So that's what I want to talk about. But I, I'm a firm believer that people are a combination of, you know, the, the, their experiences in life. They're, 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 you know, and their experiences in life kind of set the direction of, of who they are. So I want to tell you a little bit about my background. Um, I grew up in, in real, uh, a very rural part of the United States in the state of Wyoming. Um, as you can see, very beautiful place to live, lots of mountains, lots of rivers. Um, but, you know, there are, 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 you know, summers weren't very long. It was a high mountain valley, uh, about 6,500 feet of elevation. And so we really only had three seasons, last winter, this winter, and next winter. And we'd have that, you know, two or three weeks during the summer when everything would actually thaw and you'd get, you know, beautiful pictures like this. But in those short summers, I liked to go down to the river and I'd always be down at the river. I would be either fishing or swimming or floating or throwing rocks in the river, but I, I just loved to to spend time in the river. And so I want to come back and use this, this idea of as a, a river as, a, as an analogy in, in some of the things I'm going to talk about here today. Um, how many people here in Brisbane like the river? Well, except when it floods, right? But it's... Too it's, soon. Too soon. <laughs> but, but, you know, I, I love being near the water. There's just something about a river that's peaceful and, and, and I, I, I enjoy it. Um, so. A little bit about my background, uh, when, I when I finally left Wyoming, went to, went to university, uh, worked on a degree in computer engineering, okay, I'm not quite that old, but uh, while I was getting a, uh, my degree, I happened to take a class on Unix and kind of learned the Unix way. Um, I learned that my fingers were magical instruments and if, they, if you put them in VI, then they can do wonderful things. Uh, any VI users here? Yay. Any Emacs users here? Yay, I won't, I won't harass you too bad. Um, but I learned the power of the command line. I learned the power of, uh, of the Unix way of doing things, of having small little tools that work together. Um, and that helped me get uh, a job while I was going to school uh, as a systems administrator and a programmer. Um, by the time I finished university, I had no interest whatsoever in, in doing electronics, what I was supposed, supposed to be studying. I had a lot more interest in in systems administration and, and Linux and that sort of thing. Um, from there, I, uh, I had you know a, a number of different jobs. Most of them doing uh, systems administration and, and web programming, some some DBA work. Um, worked for a company that had about 6,500 Linux servers. So I learned very quickly that while it's easy to do things you know on on a, on a single box or a couple of boxes. Once you scale that up to thousands and thousands of servers, you've got to be a little more careful about the way you engineer systems, about the way you approach systems management. Um, you find out in a hurry that servers are living, breathing animals. Um, how many of you here, if, if you had a son or daughter that came to you and said, hey, will you buy me a pony? What would you say? What's the first thing, that, the first thought that comes into your mind? 
Cost. No. <laughs> Cost. You're going to say, well, we're going to have to have a place for it to live, and we're going to have to feed it, and we're going to have to clean up after it. And so you start thinking about the logistics behind, okay, what's it really going to take to own a pony, right? Well, I think you should take that exact same mindset when you set up a new server. Too many times I see people set up a server, no, I'll just set up that server and then I'm done, right? That's not quite really the way that it, it, it works out. Uh, you, you should th have a little you know, foresight to think, oh, I've got to take care of that server, I've got to keep it ma maintained, I've got to keep it up to date. If for some reason it dies, then I'm going to have to replace it, um, you know, those sorts of things. So I, so I learned um, how not to be sloppy with systems management. Um, from then, I, I took kind of a, a, a weird um, path in my career. I really got into voice over IP in a big way. Um, anybody here use Asterisk? Voice over IP platform. I got really, really heavy into the Asterisk community. Um, I was co-author on the O'Reilly book on, on Asterisk. Um, served as the community relations manager in the Asterisk community. Uh, ran some, some of the training departments around, uh, around Asterisk. Got into Asterisk in a big way. And spent five or six years really heavy in, in the voice over IP industry. Um, and then uh, this last July, Red Hat hired me to be the Fedora project leader. And I haven't quite figured out if I tricked them into hiring me or they tricked me into wanting, actually wanting this job. I haven't quite figured that out. But uh, here I am today as, as the Fedora project leader. So what does it mean for me to be the Fedora project leader? Well, there's kind of three roles that, that I play. Um, one is I lead the project. I'm the chairman of the Fedora board, uh, and we, as the board, set kind of the, the direction, the strategic direction of where we want Fedora to go. Um, in addition to that, I'm kind of a liaison between Red, the, the co corporate culture at Red Hat and this open source community we call Fedora, and act as a, as a conduit and a, and, and, and a bridge between those two communities. Um, and so in a lot of ways, I, I represent Red Hat to the Fedora community. I re represent the Fedora community back to Red Hat and make sure that there's that, that flow of communication. And then um, last but not least, uh, I'm kind of a, the head cheerleader and, and, and figurehead for the Fedora project. I get to travel around the world, speak at conferences, keep people excited and, and, and interested in what's going on at Fedora. All right? So that's a little bit about me and, and how, how we got to where we are, at least how I got to where I am. Now let's talk about... How did Fedora come to be? How did we get to where we are in Fedora today? So let's go back in history a little bit and let's talk about a red hat. Well, okay, not that red hat. That red hat. Nice little, nice little company started up in the backwoods in North Carolina. Not exactly a, a place in the United States you'd think of for great software companies to come out of. Um, and they kind of had an interesting model. It was this company that they were gonna give software away for free and then make money on t-shirts and hats. And it worked okay, sort of, for, for a few years. Um, and so there's probably many of us out there that had something like this, right? How many people started on Red Hat 4.2 or 5 or 5.1, 5 5.2? 5 yeah, I started on 4.2. I couldn't find a good picture of a, uh, a 4.2 CD, so I, I had to use this picture. But, um, and you, you, you all remember you know, kind of how it was every, you know, Every six months or so, you know, there would be a new version, and some of them were better than others. You probably can remember in your head, oh, yeah, I remember that run release was really bad. Oh, yeah, that 7.3 release was really good, right? And so that's kind of where, you know, where I came into things. Um, and if you, if you went out and bought the support contract for, for Red Hat Linux, you basically had about 18 months of, of support and package updates. Um, the problem with that model is that it didn't work re really well. To be frank, an 18-month release cycle just didn't give independent software vendors and hardware vendors time to get things up and working for the, you know, for, uh, for Red Hat, for the next, next version of Red Hat. And Red Hat wasn't very successful in, uh, in really marketing that and, and making a lot of revenue off of it. Um, thankfully, someone com came along and saw the light and said, we've really got two different competing interests here. We've got people who are really wanting to use Linux in an enterprise environment where people are very risk averse and like slow, steady, might I even say the word boring, um, approach to, to, to systems management. At the same time, we have all these really cool geeks that just like the technical bits and they want the, the latest and greatest. And they're a little more cu cutting edge. They're not, you know, they're not uh, you know, really that interested in, in something that you know, evolves very slowly. And so there was kind of a split and that's where we got uh, Fedora. 
Um, and by this time, kind of Red Hat had kind of matured as a company as well. Um, you know, they, they had found a business plan that worked. They'd, they'd, they'd gone, you know, become a public company. Um, and at that time, they were really interested in being a little more open with the community, opening up some of the, you know, some of the things that they did internally. And, and, and that's kind of where we got Fedora. And so Fedora is kind of the community-focused, um, rapid devolution, rapid development piece um, that's really, at, that, at this stage in the game, managed by the community. And, and Red Hat uses that to, to kind of set, set some goals, get some early insight into technologies that are evolving, um, and that sort of thing. And we'll talk more about that here in the next few minutes. Um, I think, to be brutally honest, I think this was a big gamble on Red Hat's part. I think they had to pr take a pretty big leap of faith to say, we're going to put a lot of trust in the community and hope that they do the right thing. You know? But for me, it was very refreshing because I was, I was one of these community people who was helping out you know, in, in Fedora um, from a community standpoint and was, was glad to see that level of trust come from Red Hat. Um, and I think as, as time has gone on, the, commun the Fedora community has come to trust Red Hat you know, in the opposite direction as well. Um, obviously, on the, on the commercial side, Red Hat at the time of the split also created what we call RHEL or Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Um, so this is a subscription model. You buy a subscription for your support and your updates, that sort of thing. It's a 24 to 36 month uh, release cycle. So slower, the old boring stuff, but it's rock solid. Comes with seven or more years of updates, which businesses love to hear. And you know, it's, it, it may be the old boring stuff, but you know, for, for the, those uh, very risk averse systems administrators, it's just something rock solid that they can depend on. The hardware vendors love it, um, that sort of thing. And so the question always becomes, and I love the, I, I love this picture because it's, but it, because it says it so clearly, how do we keep the competing interests between Fedora and Red Hat from, from conflicting? Because there is some tension there. I, 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 you know, I won't sugarcoat it. Um, so what does each side get out of that relationship? So that's what, the, what I want to explore over the next few minutes. Um, for Fedora, um, the benefit to us is that we have this, you know, this benefactor out here, this, this rich uncle who can provide some salaries, um, help us out with logistics, help us out with things like you know, export compliance and legal hoops that we have to jump through and that sort of thing without us having to worry about that on our own. We don't have to try to go out and make money with Fedora to, you know, to, to solve those kinds of problems. Um, um, you know, obviously, you know, we can focus on, on innovation. Um, the other thing that, uh, that Fedora gets, gets out of the, the relationship is we can serve as an upstream and be close, as close to the upstream communities as possible. So what does Red Hat get out of the deal? Well, they get uh, a chance to see what's coming in the future um, with, with technologies. Um, they have a chance to identify problems early on um, before they make it into Red Hat Enterprise. Um, and Red Hat, this also gives Red Hat a mechanism uh, where it's much more transparent, much easier for them to interact with, with the software community at large. And so I, I, I really think it is a win-win situation. Let's dive in a little more detail and talk about, well, how does that work? Okay, so let's start off talking about software, and particularly open source software. Where does software come from? Do you just wake up one morning and, hey, there's software on my front porch? That would be nice. Pixie dust, uh, I'll have to get some of that. Software theory. How about committees? Does software come from committees? Does innovation come from committees? Uh, not usually, unfortunately. So where does software come from? And from VI. <laughs> Smart answer. Gets, I got a prize for you afterwards. G -g Great answer. No, software comes from an individual, typically uh, an individual. Every once in a while you get two or three people working together. But typically software starts with one person having a great idea and say, hey, I should go write this. Right? And then as they write it, as other people start becoming interested, we build software communities. So what is a community? Bunch of people. Okay, I've got a I've got a photo here of a community. Is it just a bunch of people who happen to live close together? They've got something in common. Oh, they've got something in common. That might be some that, that might be important. So it's not just being geographically close to somebody, but it's having something in common with them. Okay, when we talk about software communities, what might we what, what might we have in common? 
Shared values and goals, very important. Okay, so it's important to think of when we uh, when we think about software communities. Uh, I'm reminded of, a, of an interview that Linus Torvalds once gave, and somebody asked him, "Well, what's the state of the Linux community?" And Linus says, "Community? There's not really a community. There's a bunch of people using Linux for their own self-interest. It's not really a community." I thought that was an interesting definition. Um, I have a little bit different uh, definition of. Uh, of community. Um, my definition is, is, is community is a table where we all sit down and we share ideas and we try to reach some common goals together. It's very much more of a meeting place than it is, you know, th that we just happen to happen to be in the same place at the same time. Um, and yes, sometimes that discussion does turn to the picnic table itself and we have these, you know, nice, nice discussions about, oh, should the picnic table be painted and, and what, what color should we paint it and, and, and we get more caught up in the process and the <laughs> and the, you know, the machinations of, uh, of what it is we're trying to do rather than focusing on the software itself. But nonetheless, it's a, it's a, it, it's a process that we go through to work together. Um, now typically when you're talking about software communities, we kind of divide things up into, into a couple different directions. And we use this analogy of a river or a stream. And we talk about upstream code. So the code starts you know, upstream. It starts at the, uh, where it's being written. And then it wanders down, and we call that downstream. And the downstream is eventually the end user using the software. And so I like to use this analogy of a stream when I talk about Fedora. Um, the development community is, is upstream. And the consumers are the downstream. And the, the analogy works such that the closer you are to the source, the, closer, the further upstream you are, the more influence you have on the ultimate result. Right? If you're the author of the software, you have the most control over what, what that's going to do. If you're not the, let's say you're not the, the author, but you're in that software community, or you're a distribution that then distributes that software, you have a little less control over what happens with it, but you, have, you, you can exert some control or some influence over that. If you're the end user, you have even less control or less influence that you can exert on that. So we have this concept of of upstream and, and, and downstream. And one of the things that Fedora focuses on and has focused on for the past several years is doing a better job of interacting with those upstream communities and really tracking closer to those upstream communities. There was a time when Fedora was all about, well, taking the part of the, that software that was upstream but then adding a bunch of patches onto it and, and, and trying to push it in our own direction. Um, and I think it's done, we've done um, a much better job over the past, say, three or four years of of reaching out to these software communities and, and, and following them more closely and, and, and following, you know, kind of, kind of being a, a better citizen in, in that regard. So obviously, the, the major work product, the major result of what we do in Fedora is, you know, a CD image or a DVD image that comes out every six months, right? So what is, what is on that disk? Just a bunch of software, right? Um, is it just a collection of packages, or is a distribution more than just a, a collection of packages? Be a bit more Hopefully it's something that's a bit more, more coherent. We'll talk about that. So let's talk about software packages in general. First of all, why do we package things up in a particular packaging format? Whether, whether you happen to use the RPM format like Red Hat and Fedora and SUSE do, whether you're using the DEB packaging like you know, Debian and, and, and uh, Ubuntu and some of the other distributions use. Why do we package software up the way we do? The facility to the users and dependency tracking. Mm -hmm. For dependency tracking, for making it easier to install and uninstall. All the software isn't separate, it interacts. It interacts. So it's not just individual pieces, but there's some cohesion between the different pieces. Um, anytime I talk about software packages, I, I like to think of them as building blocks. Okay? And these building blocks have little, if you've ever used the Lego building blocks, anybody here like Lego? I'm a, I'm a sucker for Lego. I remember when I got married, my wife said, no, I thought I was going to have to say this to our kids, but Jared, you need to put down the Legos and go to work, you know? <laughs> so I love the analogy of, of, of Lego blocks as, as software packages because you notice they have these little knobs on them and they fit together and you can build all kinds of cool things, right? And I might want to build a spaceship with my Legos. You might want to build a castle. You might want to build a boat. You want, might want to build a motorcycle. There are these building blocks and you can put them together in different combinations to create some really cool things, right? And so in Fedora, yeah, we have a lot of packages, 
But what I think is more important than just having a lot of packages is having p packages that fit together, that are, you know, work together to build something great. And so, just like this, this set of, of building blocks that looks like a little European town, um, I like the fact that different pieces are working together. They, can, they, they fit together, they, 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 they form more of a, a, a cohesive whole. Well, obviously it's more complicated than that, but that gives you just that kind of a general analogy that we can follow. Now, let's talk about the, the Fedora release cycle here for a second. Um, this graphic shows that, for example, in, in June of 2009, we released Fedora 11. Um, we have a 13-month um, update cycle for, for that, meaning we're going to provide package updates and bug fixes and that sort of thing for 13 months. Um, so while Fedora 11 is out there, we have six months of development, and then we release Fedora 12. Then we do another six months of development, and we release Fedora 13. Um, you can see right here, um, we've, we've released uh, Fedora 14 um, late last year, uh, first, end, end of October, first part of November, and now we're in the development cycle for Fedora 15. So we've had these, these six-month releases. Um, this, this coming May will be the you know, 15th release of Fedora, and then we're, again, on track, six months. And it's not necessarily just, hey, when that six-month mark comes, ship whatever bits happen to be in, in whatever state they are. Um, we focus very much on saying, yeah, we want to try to stick to the six-month schedule as much as we can, but we're going to have release criteria, and we're going to say, these are the things we want to have working, and if they're not working, yeah, we're going to slip the schedule a week or two weeks or maybe even three weeks. But, but we, you know, we, we, we want to make sure that what we ship is, is high quality, but we don't want to let perfection be the enemy of, uh, of something that's good enough. So, so there's some give and take there. Um, we, could, we could say, hey, we're not going to ship until everything's perfect, and then we'd never ship anything, right? Because that's the nature of software. There's always that next version that fixes a few things and adds some more features and, and those sorts of things. So what this really means is that Fedora, um, you can think of as, as this gal on the kayak, um, and it's, it's always pushing to be upstream. Okay? A little further behind that, you have things like Red Hat Enterprise. You can see this kayak down here as being Red Hat Enterprise. A little further downstream, um, not quite as, as far out there on the cutting edge, and Red Hat Enterprise Linux really tracks what's happening in Fedora. So when Red Hat decides they want to do the next version of uh, of Red Hat Enterprise, they look and say, oh, what's been successful in Fedora? What things have really worked well in Fedora? Let's use that as a base to start from to build Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Okay. Now, there's lots of different places where um, Fedora and Red Hat Enterprise Linux interact with, with software communities. Let me give you just one example, and this is probably the most notable example, and that's with the Linux kernel. Everybody needs a kernel, right? And everybody knows the basic idea of how the, how the kernel development works. You have, you know, Linus is, the, is our benevolent dictator. Um, he's got lieutenants, he's got subsystems maintainers, and then development under that. But it really all, all kind of flows up through Linus and when he decides to pull into his tree, right? So Red Hat cares very much about helping out in that community. Red Hat employs over 100 people specifically working on just kernel, whether that's generalist, whether that's specific subsystems, whether that's working on particular hardware. Um, Red Hat very deeply cares about being in the upstream communities that matter most to, to Red Hat and to, and to Red Hat's customers. And so we put a lot of effort and a lot of time and a lot of employees in, in the places that matter most, like the Linux kernel, because we care and, 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 and want to help out in those areas. Um, to give you an idea, the, the, the Linux Foundation every year or so puts out a, a, a publication that tracks who's, who's putting code in the Linux kernel, where did that code come from, were they employed by a corporation, or were they um, contributing things on their own, that sort of thing. Um, their, their latest release, which came out last month, says that 12.4% of all the code in the Linux kernel came from Red Hat, or Red Hat employed folks, which is pretty healthy. Um, if you look at it compared to, compared to the other contributors, Red Hat has the largest chunk, followed by Intel, Novell, IBM. 
and on on down you can see the different and these these change from month to month a little bit sometimes you know companies allow a little bit more drop down and you know for example some companies will add a big device driver and that'll add a bunch of lines of code and then over time their contributions will be smaller again but red hat has consistently been at the top of this list this was this was this was uh, this was last year yes yep um, another interesting statistic is maintainer sign-offs on code. So you know when, when, a, when a patch goes into the Linux kernel, it needs to be signed off by somebody to check to they've reviewed it and they, they're, they're happy with it. Um, again, the, the, the numbers at the end of last year, 37.7% of the commits going into the Linux kernel were signed off by someone at Red Hat. So that, again, just, a, just an example of, uh, of our commitment to the code. So now looking at the, at, at the kernel from kind of the Fedora perspective, um, obviously our mantra is, is, is upstream. So we want to try to carry as few patches as, as possible to the kernel. We'd rather push those changes upstream where they belong. So that every time a new kernel comes out, we don't have to go rebase all our patches and, you know, and that sort of thing. Um, so it's a slightly slower rate of change than the upstream kernel, but again, we want to push as many changes as we can upstream. Um, and that really smooths out the user experience with, with open source. So here's, a, here's a, an interesting slide. Um, I, I should have re-pulled these numbers for a little bit newer kernel, but when, uh, when Fedora 12 came out, um, you can see we, we were using the 2.6.31 kernel, and you see how many patches against that kernel we had, somewhere in the neighborhood of a, you know, right around 100, 120 patches. Um, as time went on, when the 2.6.32 kernel came down, obviously, over half of those were already in the upstream kernel, so then we were only carrying 60 patches against the kernel. And then as time went on, we got a few more and a few more until the next upstream kernel was released, then more of those were, were upstreamed. And again, the idea is to have carry as few of our own special changes as possible and push as much as we can into the upstream communities where it makes sense. Okay, now why do all this? What's, what's the point? Why do we go to this effort? Um, Again, I want to talk about what does, you know, what does Fedora get out of the, the, this? What does Red Hat get out of this? Um, the, the most important thing for, for Red Hat is to be able to see what's coming on the horizon. To get, kind of get some early insight into what are new technologies, what are people interested in, and that sort of thing. And so they can look and see what's, what's happening in, in Fedora as a, good, as a good way to say, is, is software working? Is it, is it mature? Is it ready enough? For, for people to be able to use it in the enterprise. Um, another thing that Red Hat gets out of it is an early feedback mechanism. Hardware vendors, software vendors, individuals can try out Fedora and then say, hey, this is really working, we want this in Red Hat Enterprise. Or, hey, you know, you're making these changes in Fedora, but I hope this never makes it into Red Hat Enterprise because I don't think it's ready. Those sorts of things. So it's a, it's a great um, feedback mechanism. Um, another thing it does is it's a place where People from the outside can help contribute and feel like you know they're part of the you know they're part of building something that's that, that, that's that's making the world a better place. It's something that they can take pride in um, in helping and contributing because that's frankly the reason why a lot of us contribute to open source, right? It's not for the money necessarily. More than that, it's for being being able to contribute to something that's that's better than than the way we found it. I love the phrase that says, none of us is as smart as, as all of us. Because I think that really truly epitomizes what open source is all about. That any individual here, no matter how smart they are, is not as smart as, uh, as the community as a whole. And I think that's, that's, that's very powerful. Um, another thing that, uh, that this gives to, to Red Hat and Fedora, there's some give, give and take here, is tools. I can't tell you how many times we in the Fedora community have implemented tools that Red Hat has some, its own internal tool for solving this particular problem. And after, after a couple of years, the Fedora tool ends up being so much better than the Red Hat tool that the Red Hat folks adopt the, the Fedora tool for, for doing those sorts of things. Um, innovation happens in, in Fedora and, and, and this is you know, one of the things that, that we see. The other thing is the opposite. Um, a lot of times 
Um, Red Hat has internal tools and they'll contribute those to Fedora and get those out and, and, and make those open source things um, so that the world can benefit from those as well. So there's a give and take there as far as tooling goes. Um, one of my favorites is a tool that Red Hat uh, that started out as a Red Hat internal tool and then got open sourced as a, as a program called Publican for taking, uh, for writing technical documentation. You write your technical docu documentation in DocBook XML and then use Publican to create HTML or PDF or ebook versions of, of that documentation. It's a very, very slick tool. Um, so that's, uh, again, one of the benefits. Now, I won't say that the, the relationship between Fedora and Red Hat is, is exactly perfect. Obviously, there's competing demands there. Um, it's a work in progress. Um, but I think we've done, done a, a tremendously good job of communicating through um, differences when there's differences of opinion or, or, or different conflicts. Um, and again, that's one of my jobs as the Fedora project leader is to be a conduit for that type of communication, um, keeping the channels of communication open. Um, before, I, before I finish up my, kind of my, my formal presentation here, um, the, the third question that people typically ask me about, uh, about my job and what I do is, well, what do you see the biggest enemy of Fedora as being? What's, what's your biggest challenge? Um, and there was probably a time when I, when I was going to say, well, the biggest enemy to, to Fedora or to Linux in general was some other large software corporation. Okay? And there was a time when I thought, well, maybe Red Hat's going to be the biggest enemy to Fedora. You know? Um, you know, what, the, what, are, what are they going to do with Fedora? Um, to be honest, my biggest concern today is the biggest enemy we have inside of Fedora is Fedora itself. Um, I don't think that Red Hat's ever going to do anything to destroy Fedora. I don't have any indication that they would ever do such a thing. Um, I don't think that, you know, uh, a, a, another large software corporation is ever going to be able to come along and, and, and do anything to, to hurt Fedora. I think, if anything, um, Fedora gets held back by, by, by its own people sometimes. Since sometimes we're so busy tearing each other down that we don't do a, do a good enough job internally in our own community of, uh, uh, of, of taking care of each other and, and lifting each other up. We're, we tend to be um, too focused on the negative sometimes and, and not, not enough focused on the positive. I think we tend to be more vocal in our, you know, in our, you know, when we have complaints than we do with, you know, vocal with our praise. And so that's something that you know, I obviously focus on in the Fedora community is making sure that we you know, take good care of the people who take care of us. Um, to kind of finish up my, my, the formal part of my talk here, I want to talk about why, why do we do all this work? Why do we build software distributions? Why do we work in, in, in open source software? And I think this sign right, right here sums it all up. We all live downstream. Have you ever noticed if, if you go out here to the street and there's a drain in the side of the street, you ever notice what it has stamped, stamped on, the, on the side of the drain there? What does it say? That's right. It says, hey, this drains into, this drains into the river or this drains into, into the lake or this drains into the ocean. Wouldn't make sense to go pour a bunch of motor oil down the, down the storm drain, would it? Why? Because we all live downstream from somewhere. And I think the same goes for, for, for software. Um, we make the world a better place because we're all end users of the this, this software that we're building. Um, we're all end users, whether it's Apache or Asterisk or VI um, or one of the distributions, whether it's Debian or whether it's Fedora or whether it's Ubuntu. We all live downstream, and I think that, that sums up why we do what we do. Uh, with that, I want to, want to just open it up for questions or comments. Again, we'll, we'll pass around a microphone so that we can try to capture the audio on the, on the presentation. But uh, again, I want, want you know, not, not only questions, but if you have comments or feedback, I'd love that as well. Just hands up and I'll pass it around. Hold it right very close to your mouth, okay, like that. Uh, one thing that I've always wondered about is going on this downstream thing, what sort of relationship does Red Hat, if any, have with CentOS? So it's, it's, it's an interesting relationship. Um, and, and, and this is just my own opinions. Don't, you know, don't, don't, you know, don't take this as, as official Red Hat uh, commentary, but it's, it's an interesting relationship. Obviously, Red Hat believes in the open source model. It's, it's, it's part of the very fabric of what makes Red Hat Red Hat. And, and that's why they, all the source is available, and they're available source RPMs. So it's, frankly, very, very easy for someone to come along and rebuild those. Um, I, wouldn't say, you know, I wouldn't say that Red Hat dislikes the CentOS community. I think there are some people. Um, 
I've got to be careful how I say this, but there are some people, um, particularly in the sales, the sales side of Red Hat, who don't understand maybe the, the, the model uh, as well and how open source works that, that might be scared of it. Um, but, in, but in general, I, you know, I, I think it's a you know, pretty, you know, Red Hat understands that that's part of, you know, part of what comes in, in playing with open source is, is that you take the best bits from other people and other people take the best bits from you and it's a, it's a give and take relationship there. Um, I, I wouldn't say there's any animosity towards CentOS. Um, like I said, if, if anything, the, the, biggest, the biggest thing I've seen is, is when people are trying to sell Red Hat Enterprise into a, into a business and, and feeling, you know, you know maybe, maybe fear isn't the right word, but, but some consternation as to, as to how, can I, how can I sell this if, if CentOS is giving it away for free. But you know, that's, that's, that's you know, kind of par for the course. We've got uh, 10 minutes, so plenty of time to ask some more questions or comments, folks. Actually, on the similar vein, perhaps mm -hmm. you can repeat what um, I asked Jared just as he came in about, um, uh, I had actually shifted to Ubuntu when it first came out on the basis of, as I thought, that it had a superior package manager being Debian, which I thought at the time was somewhat superior to RPM. And uh, Jared managed to convince me in about 45 seconds what a complete bungle it was that I should have shifted in. <laughs> so perhaps you could explain again um, the differences as they are now rather than back then between the package management and anything significant. Sure. And, and what, what I explained is, is that I think all package management in Linux has come a long way over the past you know, 10 years or so. Um, whether, whether you're using the RPM format or whether you're using the DEB format, they're both great formats. They both do a great job of, of, uh, of explaining what's in the software package and what are the dependencies and how do those fit together. Obviously, there's differences on how we handle individual um, cases and, and you know that's that's another topic for another day but I think around the individual packaging formats we've also done a better job of of the tooling that finds those packages finds their dependencies uh, we've done a better job of organizing repositories so that you can go out and find um, different collections of software that, that work better um, I think um, software communities in general have done a better job of, of saying oh I'm not just going to provide a tarball um, when I make a new release, but working with distributions to say, hey, I want I want my software in Debian, or I want my software in Fedora, or I want my software in, you know, Ubuntu or OpenSUSE or whatever the whatever the the, the case may be. There, um, I know you know my most of my own experience has obviously been on the on the RPM side. Uh, I think our Yum tool has come a long way, um, and to 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 be frankly honest, it was. Um, it was suboptimal when it first came out, and it had some interesting challenges. But we've, I, th I think, you know, we've done a great job of, of, of overcoming you know, some of the, some of the challenges we've had. I know that the, the, that a lot of the tools around the, you know, the Deb packaging format have come a long ways as well, and I think we're all all better off for it. Again, excuse my ignorance, um, because I'm still on Ubuntu. But would you say that it's the Yum RPM combination that really is important, or RPM on its own? No, uh, I, 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 would I would definitely say it's the combination. Just just like if you're on uh, on Debian or Ubuntu, you need both the the, the Deb packages themselves and a tool like apt-get or aptitude to, to help you manage those packages. I think it's the combination of both the packages and the tooling. And to be honest, there's a lot of work going into right now getting the different uh, software distributions to work together on the tooling, whatever the underlying packaging format has to be, trying to come up with a little more unified front as far as the, the, the tooling itself. Well, you kind of just preempted my question then. Um, when you brought up package management, I've used Yum and Apt, and as you said, I think they're all great tools I'm pretty um, distro agnostic when it comes to that. Um, but it seems to be duplicating work, not just in package management, in lots of areas. Now, the ultimate goal is, of course, upstream mm -hmm. in any code for everyone to benefit. But does Fedora have much of a relationship with other distros, try to stop duplication of work? Um, um, I, I, would say, I would have to say that traditionally we probably haven't. Um, that's one thing that, that I really want to focus on and I, I'm hoping to, to, to work on. If you, if you turn around and, uh, and see Stefano there, he and I are, have actually started up some conversations. We're actually going to be kicking off a, a, a conversation at FOSDEM here in a couple of weeks in, in, in Brussels to actually talk about you know, how, how can we as distributions work together, communicate better, um, treat each other with a little more civility and, and work together. Cause, cause, 
nobody gains if we're if we're wasting time and effort, you know, competing against each other in, in, instead of focusing on what's the, what's really important here, and that's to move all of Linux and all of open source forward. Um, we don't need to reinvent the wheel five different times or six different times or sixty different times. So, so there. Oh, go ahead, go ahead, please. So, so we have just had um, like a week ago a wonderful example of cross distro collaboration. So um, Vincent Unz from GNOME from um, OpenSUSE actually proposed a cross distribution meeting on how to develop application installer, let's say, a la software center. Okay, so and people from several different distributions, Debian, uh, Fedora, and uh, Magia, and OpenSUSE sit at the same table and design technologies and look at the existing technologies to kind of refactor them and design something together. So that is something very good that, that we need in distributions, but the idea of having universal packages which work on all distribution is kind of a red herring because as someone said before, a distribution is just not just, you know, distributing software is actually blending together in some uniform way and in the choice of how you blend together they're in something specific of every single distribution so in debian we have a policy which is not necessarily the same they have in fedora and actually the difference in the policy actually are good for the ecosystem so people can try with different you know um, policies and see what works best and give some uh, diversity to the to the ecosystem still we need to you know refactor stuff and minimize efforts elsewhere Uh, this is almost following on again from that. Uh, one issue still at the moment with some of the distributions is uh, support for a variety of architectures and platforms. Mm -hmm. um, there's still a number of areas where 64 bits, almost a second class platform, even on Intel style architecture. Mm -hmm. You know, what can we do about this? Because especially when we're dealing with vendors who are uh, distributing their software outside of the um, um, Linux distributors tree because they're not entirely open source or for whatever other reasons. Right. Um, it's often a struggle to get it for your particular architecture, be it x86-64 or PowerPC or whatever else you happen to be running it on. Mm -hmm. you know, we, what, what more can we do in that space? Well, I, th I think first of all we have to we have to make sure that that those architectures are working well with the software we do control, with the open source software. So for example, in the Fedora community, we've focused heavily on, you know, we have our primary architecture, you know, x86, you know, both 32-bit and 64-bit, but we've got a strong power PC community in Fedora. We've got a, a, a where we've got a strong Spark community that Dennis helps with. And, you know, there's there's oftentimes struggles when you take even even open, open source software and try to port it to a, to a new architecture. We're doing a lot with ARM in Fedora right now. And, and you know, uh, just this past week, we've got all of Fedora 14 now running on on the S390, um, and so I think that's the first thing that we can focus on is just getting our own our own house in order, so to speak. Um, but second is is the way with the we communicate um, these changes up to to upstream communities. Um, you know, let's one of the one of the biggest examples that that comes to mind is is like Adobe and and, and Flash Player. Um, the company that I was working for, where I managed the 6,500 Linux servers that I talked about earlier in the in the slide, was a big uh, web analytics company called Omniture. They've since been bought out by Adobe, and so a lot of my former coworkers are now Adobe employees. And and I happened to strike up a conversation with them, and and they mentioned that one of the things that absolutely drives Adobe crazy is that only maybe four or five percent of the, their you know Flash customers are running on Linux. But that that small minority of uh, of users are by far the, by far the most vocal, and when the Linux folk, and when and the, and, they, and they went on to say that when the Linux folks are vocal, they tend to be very rude, they tend to be very, um, well, yeah, um, they they don't. Um, you know, they don't communicate in a, in a very adult fashion, let me put it that way. And so I think the second thing that we can do is, is, is when we're asking, you know, these, these, these software companies to help support us, do it in a, in a kind way and not in a condescending way. Um, obviously, you know, we can say, ah, this doesn't work and you're awful and you should, you should change. But I think we, we would get a lot further um, if we took a step back and, and, and tried to present a, a unified front that was friendly and say, yes, we, we have these concerns. We would love to have your software in, in this particular flavor or format, but we understand the constraints you're under and, 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 and you know, try to work with these, these companies rather than, than, than work against them. I think I think in an event like this, the community, the, the people that are kind of in a room like this, we're the guys who should be tying this out and living with some of the pain, making those book reports, 
mm -hmm. filtering changes upstream. Personally, I've been using uh, 64 bit Linux on my laptops now for maybe about three years and gone through that pain with Flash, with Skype, with those other tools that, as much as I'd love to only use open source alternatives, sometimes that's not possible. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that, work through that, report those issues, and then make a better ecosystem for everybody else. Yep. Thank you. Okay, great, thanks. Great, Time great for one more. One on, one on the back row, it looks like. So most people probably have a pretty good idea what the what the audience, what the target of Ubuntu is and of uh, of Debian. Uh, Debian is the universal distribution. Ubuntu is more focused on the desktop, and most of the other distributions have a very clear focus. What would you say as the as a Fedora lead? What Fedora actually is, what its audience is, and and, and what what our target actually should be. Um, that's one of the things that the Fedora board in particular has spent the last oh, year and a half or so working on. Um, Paul Frields, who was the, the former Fedora project leader, um, spent, spent about a year working on it. And then when I became the Fedora project leader, I've kind of done the follow-up work. Um, but we've set um, both, a, both a, a target audience for Fedora. Um, our tar target obvious audience for Fedora is someone who is technically capable, someone who is voluntarily moving to Linux, um, someone who is willing to communicate and, and, and ask questions and, and, and get help, that sort of thing. Um, you can go to the Fedora Project Wiki to get a, a better description of, of what the Fedora target audience is. Um, some of the other things that the Fedora board have done is set both a mission statement and a, and a vision statement for what we want to see, um, the direction that we want to see, see Fedora headed in. And again, all that's on the Fedora Project Wiki. Um, and then what we're doing right now is working on kind of the governance structures inside of Fedora, um, starting with the, the Fedora board and then going out to our steering committees, whether it's our engineering steer, steering committee, what, that we call FESCO, whether it's our ambassador steering committee, whether it's the special interest groups like documentation and, um, you know, translation and, and, and design and, and some of the other uh, special interest groups in Fedora. And sitting down and talking with them and saying, you know, what are your top two or three or four goals that not only you'd like to see happen in Fedora over the next few releases, but that you're willing to, 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 to work on and, and help contribute to. Um, you know, and, and that's been an interesting experience. Um, it's taken a lot of time and it's, it's, it's taken a lot of effort to try to focus and say, yeah, there's, there's 20,000 directions we could go in, but we have limited resources and so we need to, we need to focus on what's more, most important. Um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a pragmatist myself. I, I, I look at the world and I said, well, we can, we can sit here and we can talk all day about where we want to go or we can get up and go do something. And so for me, code speaks louder than, than, than theory. Um, at the same time, community, um, is, is better than code. And so there's, there's always a, a balancing act be, be, between those three, b between community, between code, and between you know, trying to engineer the, the, the perfect card house in theory. So it's, it, it's a matter of balance there, but I think we're doing a good job of at least communicating those things, getting consensus between the various groups and, and, and uh, you know, steering committees in, inside of it, or on trying to focus and, and organize ourselves to focus on what's our mission, what's our vision. And, and move forward in that direction. Um, I don't think that Fedora in the short term, especially, is ever going to be you know a, the the mainstream um, you know PC operating system the way the way Microsoft Windows is right now. Um, in the long term, that'd be great. I don't think we're going to get that in the next year or two years. Um, that being said, there are certainly things we can do to improve the user experience for people who are new to Linux, um, and, and we'll be working on some of those sorts of things. We can also do things to make the, the experience better for the experienced Linux user as well. Um, there's, there's certainly lots, lots of room for improvement. I think we're seeing um, incremental change rather than revolutionary change within, you know, within Linux. It's getting better. Um, I had the opportunity Oh, about three or four months ago to fire up an old hard drive. I had to pull some files off of an old hard drive and that, that old hard drive had uh, Fedora Core 5 on it. So, you know, basically nine releases ago and it was, it was an eye-opener for me to see just how far things really have changed in, you know, in, in the past four or five years. Um, we've, we've made a lot of progress. Is there still a long way to go? Yes, absolutely. And, you know, we're, we got, we've got to be in it for the long haul and not be willing, you know, it might be easy to take some shortcuts along the way, but we've got to keep our focus on the, on the long term and make sure we're doing what's, what's best for 10 years from now or 20 years from now and not, you know, say, oh, well, you know, this will get us 
three months down the road, let's take the shortcut, because I, I think we're selling ourselves short if we do that. And on that note, I'd like to present you with a token of appreciation from Linux Australia. Thank you. Um, these are um, macadamia husk uh, bowls, really nice. There's a whole story that everyone's heard several times, so I won't bore you with all that um, again. Suffice, uh, but since you did come from the USA, we got you a special one. That actually started its life as the... Um, there was a plug in the Wyvernhoe Dam above Brisbane, um, which fell out, which caused the Brisbane floods in the first place. So, <laughs> there you go. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Please Appreciate thank that. Jared. Thank you. Let me just add that I do have my uh, email address up here. Smith at fedoraproject.org. I'm, I'm very easy to find. If you're on IRC, my, nick, my nickname on IRC is J Smith. It can't be e any easier than that to track me down. If you do have questions, if you do have comments, if you have feedback, um, I really am interested in, in, in hearing from you. Um, feel free to get a hold of me if you have any questions. Thank you.